First of all, thank you. I'm so pleased to be up here with the two of you, and I have loved kind of getting to know you virtually over the last few weeks and reading your writings and watching your YouTube videos, and it's really great to see you in person. Um, so I'm hoping we can just kind of have a little conversation, and then um, we're gonna give about 15 minutes at the end for questions, so if you have them, or if you've already thought of them during these wonderful presentations that you got, write them down, and then we'll make sure there's mics out there for you to ask questions and give plenty of time for that. So I just kind of want to um, dive right in, Ramesh. Um, in your work, you really talk about how online companies are shaping the way that we live and they shape our beliefs and our work and really our lives in big ways. And they, um, they act on all of us. It doesn't matter what race we're from, where we live in the world, you know, we have just this powerful influence of technology on us all the time. And now we're seeing this widespread adoption of the exact same platform kind of cookie cuttered across the world with no kind of regard to the cultures that they're being implemented in and no direct input from the end user either. So um, I'm wondering, you know, how can we ensure that in the technological development of the future, you know, what can we do to make sure it's inclusive of people of all demographics? Yeah, that's such such a killer question <laughs> um, and a tough, tough task. Um, so, you know, any time um, a technology is designed in one place and is used in another or with designed by one group of people and used by another, there are naturally going to be disconnections, right? Because we are not the same as other people, right? I mean, it's kind of obvious. So there's, so, so what we've seen is sort of a, a fragmentation or a geographic cultural, spatial, et cetera, distancing between the producers and, and also monetizers of technology and um, those who use that technology, right? And so, you know, you've all heard that aphorism, right? If you're not the, um, the customer, you're the product, right? That's, uh, that's sort of uh, an idea. And so the product being sold, uh, quite honestly, is, is our own uh, forms of free expression with one another. That said, there's a great amount of value that, that has been provided to us in terms of efficiency, uh, very consumer facing in many manners, uh, by uh, efficiency optimized platforms. But efficiency is, is, a, is, a, is a quantifying and engineering kind of statement. Um, and it doesn't mean the same thing for everybody at all times in all places, right? And also a, a narrowing a vision upon some sort of closed notion of efficiency actually creates all sorts of other inefficiencies. I think of something very similar with entropy as well, by the way. I kind of riff on that a little in the book. That was really fun. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that distancing is something that I think is being increasingly acknowledged. I mean, that's why I alluded to the point of, you know, like for example, um, Google having, um, you know, setting up an AI lab in Accra um, you know, these are attempts to try to close these distances, these uh, profound distances that are actually partly a function of the fact that we are a very diverse uh, race. Uh, you know, we are, I'm sorry, not race, we are a very diverse species, right, uh, on a planetary level. Um, so that's kind of point one, right? Like, we really have to think about questions of closing distance, but also questions of out of the kind of techno-cultural experience, the experience of the human colliding with the technology, who benefits, who doesn't, right? So there are certain types of ephemeral and transient benefits. There's no question that, um, you know, especially search algorithms provide us, right? But I really, really appreciated, Dan, that you said that, you know, that search systems need to be more uh, transparent and accountable to their users. It's, it's excellent to hear someone from Google saying that. Um, and I, you know, challenge uh, them to continue to really, uh, to, to be good to that. Like, what does that look like? Um, so I think there's that facet of distancing. So uh, it's closing the gap. It's also questions of governance, right? And power and value, right? And that's really what I was trying to touch on in my talk, right? Like, who, who gains from those experiences, right? So if I have this short-term gain that is based on a peer-to-peer -peer interaction where perhaps I get an Airbnb apartment, but macroeconomically, it's kind of unhealthy for our larger society, which is already in a very unhealthy place, right? Um, that's, not, that's not the way we want to kind of, if you will, wire technology for our present or our future. Um, this all connects to the first point you made, Aaron, which I think is really important, which is that 
you know, I, I don't know how many of you, you know, kind of took classes in feminist studies and so on, but like Donna Haraway's classic text, The Cyborg Manifesto, you know, it's kind of a very dense and difficult thing to read. It's kind of amazing too. Kind of s writes about how, you know, we have long human beings been cyborgs. <laughs> um, these, the, uh, there's a sense of anxiety we have when we don't look at these things constantly. They are tied to our bodies, they're prostheses, right? So that means that our dependency and our relationship with one another, to some extent even ourselves, is very conditioned by this object or the information that it makes available uh, in our lives. It even influences how we think of ourselves. So here's the key point that I wanted to get to, um, which is there is an incredibly, there's an incredible amount of power in determining and shaping those questions around what is made visible or invisible to us, what is served to us or not. So, you know, again, the intentions of algorithm designers are not to be uh, sociopathic, right? Are not to be uh, unhealthy for, for our society. Their intentions are to have their stuff used as much as possible, of course, right? It's like a business, give me a break. If a CEO says we're gonna design a product to not be used as much, the CEO is not gonna have a job, right? We'll be replaced by someone else. The question, however, is are there business models that can exist that don't, that are not optimized for that usage and that addiction in a way that we as human beings, we're addicted to, to healthy stuff to some extent, but we're super addicted to unhealthy stuff. That dopamine, right? And so those technological systems have arrived at some sort of state, I'm not sure it's a finite state, but at some point where content is being fed to us that tends to reinforce bias and at times inflame bias. Right, because if I'm served, you know, if I'm watching a Bernie Sanders video on YouTube, and then I get served, you know, 9/11 conspiracy theory video content after that by a YouTube auto recommendation system, it keeps my attention, but may not be like the best thing in general for our society, or maybe even for me. Or if I'm watching a Donald Trump video and I get served neo-Nazi content, again, we might we might see the same thing. So we can't. That's unhealthy socially, right? So I think there's just profound responsibility for us all to come together, make decisions that are healthy, because human society and societies are far more complex than mere technological engineering questions. So that's why I think we have to guide the technologies moving forward in the image of what we all choose. We have to come together as a society, as a world, to make those decisions and shape technologies accordingly. And that's what I'm trying to argue for in the book through a ton of examples. Can I give? Yeah, Color please. commentary. Of course. <laughs> um, so I'm part of a group at, at Google called the Human Computer Interaction or User Experience Research Team, broadly speaking. And and we, you're, you're, the premise of your question was, well, you know, how do we, you know, fit these things to different groups and different populations and so on. Great. So we provide Google search services basically in every country, and there are a few countries we can't get into, and there's an interesting debate about that, but. We, as a consequence, have to work in all these different cultures and different languages. So uh, when Google started in 1980, 1998, it was English only, Stanford.edu, that's it, right? Uh, and we have grown since then. So now an interesting question for us as researchers is how do we provide Google services, say, in Arabic? How do we do them in Urdu? How do we do them in you know, different languages, different cultures? And part of the, the question there is how do we design so that it works well for that population? For instance, uh, we offer Google search services in Korea, in South Korea. Naver is the big dominant player there, so Naver completely dominates that market. Uh, we are like, oh yeah, less than 10% or something like that. Um, but the big piece of feedback we get from Koreans is, why does your page look so weird? <laughs> And, and I, of course, as a designer with sort of pseudo-Scandinavian design aspirations, thinks it's elegant, it's sleek, it's all white, it's wonderful. They say, white is the color of death. <laughs> and you don't have anything moving on your page. There are no you know, animated GIFs and so on. And what's more, do you guys know HTML? I mean, that's literally a question we get from our, and so, uh, and so we've allowed our, our Korean designers to kind of yeah, have a good time, just do something, right? Because what we're doing in Mountain View does not work in Korea. And we've realized that sort of uh, versions of that story endlessly, right? So an interesting aspect of this is 
not all cultures have the same relationship to the web as we do in Silicon Valley. Right. So for example, the Arabic language corpus that Google crawls and so on, tiny. It's not very big. It's not that there's not a lot of Arabic content in the world, it's just we can't crawl it. Right? Therefore, when you search on Google for Arabic content, there just isn't much. They haven't decided what, for whatever reason to put it out there. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, Cherokee or Clinkit or name your favorite, you know, small, small vocabulary, a small uh, group language. So we do our best. So we have a lot of programs, and especially for these underserved languages, underserved cultures, to try to bring more of their content that they want. Right? You want this stuff? We'll, we'll digitize it for you. We'll make it available. So it's a, it's an interesting interesting question. How do we design to support that? One last example. Um, for example, in India, um, lots of folks, the phone that they get is defaulted to English. Now, if you're uh, a Hindu, uh, Hindi speaker, right, that doesn't work so well, right? So, and ty it turns out typing in Hindi is a major pain, <laughs> really hard. Uh, so, most people would prefer to speak their query. And they want to speak it, say, in English, because a lot of the things they want to look at, like school schedules and stuff like that, are, are in English. But they want the results in Hindi. So, we've got this sort of interesting UI design there. It's called Hinglish. Uh, and it's a common thing that you see in India, where people will do a, a query in one language, you want the answers in another, or vice versa, whatever. So we've had to figure out how to do a lot of accommodations to that, to the local culture. And so we do that a lot. And that's sort of a lot of what hu human computer interaction is all about. And that's it's really interesting. It actually kind of feeds into what I was just about to ask you. Because um, I, I would have to imagine there's a lot of differences in how an algorithm returns results like, um, culturally based as well, right? So what I'm gonna expect Google search results to give me is gonna be different than what someone in India is going to expect, especially when you're doing now cross languages and all of that as well. Um, and so I was, I was really curious about this kind of use of, of AI, right? And we, you were t mentioning you know, Google being an AI company and talking about that, and we're actually seeing this um, into the library market now as well, with there are lots of companies that are offering tools that enable you to track literally every single thing you do in a library, and then offer pers you know, personalized search results. But you know, we know that this approach can lead to filter bubbles and the narrowing of worldviews, which is, you know, in my opinion, at least the opposite of what a library is supposed to do, and the internet, really, what were our concept of what the internet, I think, was initially was, oh my gosh, it's gonna expand the worldviews, but we're not really seeing that. And so, how do we avoid these, this filter bubble trap that AI can, can leave us in? Is, I'll it, I'll is that for me or for Ramesh? Yeah. Either and both. Okay. <laughs> Should I start? You go. Okay. And I'll comment. Okay. Yeah. So I, pu I, I had a piece uh, that I, when like my first book came out, it's called Who's Global Village. I, um, I put a piece out in, in Quartz, um, you know, and I, I shared that where I was invited to the country of Cameroon. I'd been to Mali before in West Africa. I was invited by UNESCO to go to the country of Cameroon on a project, really cool project. And the first thing I did was search for Cameroon, right? And so. The, I, I didn't find a single web page from Cameron, which it turns out has a very active English and French language blogosphere, mm -hmm. until I got to page three. And you know, Dan can give you the data better than me, but nobody goes to page three, right? It's very rare that we go past the first three or four search results themselves. Um, so why did that occur? It's not because, again, Ga Google is anti Cameroon. It, it's understanding of me, which was presented in, a, in an invisibly ordered list, without me knowing why I saw what I saw, what about me influenced those results, right? What, um, what might be the, uh, the sort of parameters that shaped the search results, not just about me, but more like corpus-based, right? All of those were invisible from that ordering. So as a result, the first sort of, uh, I mean, I got like the CIA webpage, I got the State Department webpage on page one, and like the very bottom of page one, I got the Wikipedia uh, webpage, okay. right? So it, this is just an example of these disconnections that we're all speaking about, right? Um, and the way we resolve these things increasingly um, is, you know, like per Dan's excellent examples that he just gave, is to, is to give up some power, you know? to like basically say to these communities or stakeholder communities, like here's kind of what we have, work with our stuff. 
and give us some feedback and, and, and responsiveness into an alternative mode by which information might be organized for your own polity or for your own locality, which might mean not making all information free, which might mean not making all information visible, right? Because a lot of cultures, there are protocols around the transmit, you're an anthropologist by training also, Dan. So it's like the transmissions of knowledge, the circulation of knowledge, the custodianship of knowledge, all of those are very cultural sorts of principles. So we're at this moment where like the network effects, the scalable effects, especially of Google technologies, I think Facebook is a much worse design technology in many ways. Um, but these are not understood simply as technologies, they're corporations, right, with a suite of products that interrelate with one another. Um, is, has scaled out. It's good for certain kinds of parameters, but it's not necessarily something that is tethered to the human experience of that individual in a place as part of a community themselves. So like, what we can really do is, and I just want to kind of tie this back to libraries. You all, and I said it earlier, and I was a little abstract about it, but I just want to say a little more specifically. You all are, our medi are, are the intermediary. Like You are the human uh, <laughs> guide through all of this. And the values that I believe you all support as librarians, and I know my students definitely uh, do and did, is are ones that are dedicated to public out public welfare. But not public in this, again, vacuous sense. Not like everybody, blah, blah, blah. It's more like the different interests of and, and realities and experiences and voices and concerns of those multiplicities of publics that you work with. So it's your goal, your, and, and that includes anti-surveillance training if, that, if, it, if it needs to be, you know what I mean? Like that's important too, and privacy training and encryption training or whatever, you know? So, so it's kind of like, it's up to you, I, and this is a massive charge, to try to grasp this kind of complexity of different information forms, these different forms of mediation, and to, and to kind of really work with people and communities, and that's why Librarians are super important, and that's why I really believe that librarians should should really articulate their mission as the people that really not sort of not necessarily check power, but really balance things out to ensure that you know a bunch of engineers who may not know necessarily any better. Because like honestly, when we when I was trained as an engineer, I didn't think about any of this stuff. You know, I wasn't tr I didn't learn any of this stuff. I didn't even take an ethics class. <laughs> Really, honestly, like we would have to like fill out some forms or whatever, but that was it, right? So it's, it, that's not because they're unethical, it's because engineering is often taught as morally and culturally and ethically agnostic, right? And so it's your role, and that's the place where libraries can be like the hottest stuff moving forward, rather than like, oh man, Google's, you know, mm. putting us in trouble or all this, these, you know, trite phrases I hear all the time. You are the people first digital world. And that's what I want to like really like argue for. And you can work with folks like uh, and really nice folks, especially at Google like Dan, to kind of make these things happen, you know? Thanks. Got the right person from Google here. <laughs> Not the people running Project Maven. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which is gone, but that's a separate Good. issue. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the people arose and made right. it go away. I'm um, glad. So I I was born in Compton in LA, and I grew up in South Central LA. And I was a, a passionate library user there. And I don't know if anybody's been in LA County, um, but there's a zillion branches, right? And when I, when I was young, I didn't realize I lived in a filter bubble, right? We called it the library, and there were well-meaning acquisitions people there, and there was a great, you know, uh, they did the best they could. But by definition, the collection is small, and it does not represent, you know, you try to find something about Cameroon, forget it. <laughs> Impossible, zero, zero, sure. zero hits. Sure. Um, and so what I think we've start to, started to realize is that <laughs> filter bubbles have always been with us. Absolutely. They just have different names and different kinds of technology. So now, um, but, but to your point, Aaron, um, we had this dream that once we all had access to all the world's information, we would all become Vermont Democrats and live peacefully <laughs> forever, growing our own wheat and breaking bread together. Um, uh, that didn't work Vermont out, Vermont right? independence. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it didn't quite work out that way, but um, so I'm, I'm gonna basically uh, second what you said, Ramesh, which is I do, I agree with you that um, librarians are our hope for this because uh, when I teach, I teach people that you have to get out of whatever your filter bubble is 
Be aware of the, the, the surfaces that you are within. Be aware of what boundary conditions are. So for example, one thing I, I, I have to clarify is that um, Google results are not personalized. They are localized, mm -hmm. okay? So if I search for pizza here in San Francisco, I do not want to see pizzas places in Mountain View, <laughs> right? Uh, if I search, for example, uh, the uh, Falkland Islands and I'm in, Jar in Argentina, I want to see Islas Malvinas, right? So we have to localize a lot of that stuff. And so localization is not the same as personalization. We actually use almost zero information about you other than your geocode wow. to, to personalize. I know people don't believe that. I can give you an hour on why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, just interesting. you can yeah. follow up with me at the break or something. But um, yeah, people widely believe that we personalize everything. And yeah, not true. Anyway, but the point is we, we have to teach this. It has to be a kind of a, a very intentional act. Don't just believe the people you meet on the street in San Francisco or in Silicon Valley or Hyderabad or wherever, right? You have to be aware that we are a global world. We are a global information space, and you have to consciously get out of that. May I make one other quick yeah, point? Yeah, please. Just, it's, it's not just a question of individual privacy here. If one group has power over the technological instruments that are intervening in everything that we do, even how we think, that affects systemically marginalized communities. And I didn't really get to that point yesterday. I kinda, I mean, I'm earlier today. Um, I alluded to it. I'm just in a twilight zone right now. <laughs> I've been traveling a lot. Um, it's things like predictive policing systems. Again, Google's not, this is not on Google. But it's, 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 it's those systems being used and machine learning algorithms uh, taking uh, black and brown populations and treating them as, as even as, as objects of greater surveillance and persecution. It's courtroom systems, algorithmic systems entering our courts that are judging people of color and black, black uh, defendants with misdemeanors as more at risk for future crimes than uh, Caucasian uh, individuals who have a uh, potential even history of felony convictions. These are all actual journalistic stories that are out there. So the issue is really on the, like, the scale of persecution that can occur through these harms that might have started with maybe innocent biases to begin with. That's the issue. Yeah, there's a really great book out there, Weapons of Math Destruction. Yeah, and I'm doing my first book event with her. Oh, great, she's yes. Kathy O'Neill, yeah, she's awesome. So If you want to learn more about algorithms and... Yeah, so I'm doing my first book event in New York City with her on uh, October 29th. She's awesome, yeah. Although I want to highlight something you said, which was often these... Um, these machine learning systems in particular, are kind of just math devices, and they're, like in the Tay example, they're completely contingent on the data you feed them. Precisely. You give them garbage, guess what? There's garbage in, garbage out. This is true of machine learning algorithms as well. And so I think one of the great, great points that you make, and I think we're trying to make collectively here, is diversity is strength, and in particular, one of the problems with, for example, the predictive policing and a bunch of other examples uh, of crummy ML, crummy machine learning systems, is that they were trained on terrible data sets that had no diversity. Exactly. And so, by having diverse people in the engineering population, in the data creation population, all of a sudden, guess what? Those mistakes don't happen. Or what if Black Lives Matter shaped predictive policing algorithms? That's what I'm calling for, you know? Like, like leadership in, that, in those communities, you know? And so, like Patrice Cullors, who I work with a little bit and is on the cover of my book, is it, you know like those folks are trying to intervene with LAPD uh, predictive mm -hmm. policing systems, which fortunately have been temporarily halted. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we're going to move on to some questions from the audience. I'm sure we have a ton out there. Um, we have a microphone here. Just raise your hand. Oh, no, there's a microphone here. So raise your hand if you have a question, and a microphone will magically come to you. <laughs> Testing. Hi. Um, so kind of combining the two talks from this morning, um, given that our digital experience is shaped by physical reality and politics, um, how do we kind of combat the issue where many of the decision makers or stakeholders like voters are kind of digitally illiterate? Um, so issues like net neutrality come up and nobody knows what that is. Um, when you try to talk about digital privacy, people are like, I don't know, should I care? Um, so what are the steps moving forward for us if we are on this forefront 
to try to make a difference in the policy as it affects our digital experience? Well, I, I think, <laughs> guess what? I'm gonna say the same word all over again. It's education, it's gotta be, because you're absolutely right. I've sat through way too many shall we say, congressional meetings where it's clear that the people asking the questions have no clue what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my CEO uh, had the uh, misfortune of having to say to a senator, that's not our phone. We have no idea what's going on with that. Um, and and that that's reveals a kind of fundamental misunderstanding. I mean, so I would love to see the people behind the spokesperson because the congressional staffs are usually pretty clued in. I want them to ask the questions because they know what's going on. Um, but I understand it's TV, it's politics, you know, whatever, but it's gotta be education. Uh, and I understand there are people who believe that education will never survive. The reason you're all here, I will point out, is because of education. <laughs> so it's working somewhere, and I, I think we have to do a real outreach and help, help the uh, des decision makers understand that. Yeah, we're at a moment um, now where there's a lot of popular consensus, which is kind of interesting for different reasons, uh, uh, like the Republicans and Democrats, people across uh, the economic spectrum, people across the geographic spectrum, and even across the age and racial spectra in this country all support some sort of shift in our relationship with uh, tech companies and tech issues. I don't know if you uh, look up the latest poll. It just came out about 10 days ago, two weeks ago or so. Um, Vox has reported it and a few others. So I think it's for very, <laughs> very different and strange reasons. You all probably remember when uh, President Trump tweeted that Google stole him stole from him millions and millions of votes uh, in 2016 uh, because its searches were biased toward uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, I wrote a piece in the Washington Post that came out the next day rebutting that claim, not because I'm like a unabashed fan of Thank Google, you. but because it's <laughs> <laughs> it put me in a weird state because I, 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 you know, it's sort of like that's not the way we should analyze what Google means in our lives. That's absurd. But that does mean we're at this point where now there's interest, and at least in the public, a, one, one, a, a, a real point of bipartisan agreement, if you will, uh, uh, to kind of shape the digital world in a, in a pro-people future, in a, in a pro-democratic future, something that I think Dan and I both agree on here. Um, so l let, let's do it. And I think part of the way is not just sort of seeing uh, net neutrality as sort of a standalone issue, but understanding how these specific issues are not just about random experiences of privacy, but are actually tied to our overall health as a society economically and so on. I think that, I think that explanations need to be made in economic terms uh, to show the externalities of these issues, right? So externalities, that's a term, that's a concept that shows uh, the effects that are not sort of l like rooted in the actual, in the specific experience itself, right? like the overall health of a society, right? Like, so if you care about your property value, the school district matters in your property value, right? Public health issues affect all of us, right? So we have to express these issues like, you know, net neutrality, which, you know, Google is totally supported. Um, we have to express like why they're important for everybody rather than just an individual liberty or rights issue. That might work for some small subset of the population. We have to talk about our overall health, how that affects like our jobs, our income, our income mobility, those themes. Thank you. Do we have um, anyone else over here? I think we have someone here. Or wait, we have one back here and then we'll. Hi, um, I'm the translator for, in Spanish for San Francisco Public Libraries, and I wanted to talk about Google Translate. Um, Go for it. <laughs> so I think a lot of these issues is all about balancing access and localization, and really looking at unconscious bias when evaluating cultural values of marginalized communities. Um, we. I have a coworker who does a uh, Chinese translation, and um, we have lots of talks about unconscious bias uh, with coworkers, and uh, we open a lot of conversations about how that e is expressed in the way programming is done in libraries, how that can change. And um, I think it's a big responsibility of Google to really, in, in the way of a Google Translate, to um, 
have, uh, what do they call it? Um, yeah, it's Google Translate, but it doesn't translate effectively uh, in many arenas. I worked 10 years in, in law enforcement in the courts. I remember how much argument there was economically to change interpreters to use Google Translate and things like that, and it doesn't work because at the end, the marginalized community values of how communication is done in other languages is not counted in a lot of the ways translation is done by Google. So those are the things that are way past the surface of the iceberg that really need to be looked at. And um, we in the library do a lot of that work, but there's so much more to do. It starts from the top down. M you know, um, I, hear, I hear often, why do we have to do uh, programming in other languages? Well, because we have the, those populations in our community, we serve everybody. Uh, and it's not an, uh, as it shouldn't be an afterthought, it should be part of every single design of services, of products, anytime access is in the, in the talk, we want access for everybody. Well, what are the cultural values of the marginalized communities we're serving? What is access for them? And uh, what is valuable for them? Even if we think that value is not efficient or economical. Thank you. So a, a quick comment about that. Um, I, I am, as Ramesh said, I'm sort of human-centered. Uh, and so I want people to use the services that work best for them in the situation that they're in. Right? And in particular, there are lots of conversations or lots of uh, text that I wouldn't want Google translating for me. Okay? And if, in particular, for these very socially dense, complex, interactive, or marginalized groups, eh, don't use that tool, right? It's up to you, I think, and up to all of us in these settings to choose the appropriate technology or the, tech, the appropriate method. So that may be, let me find a, a Zapotec speaker, right? Do not use Google Translate for Zapotec. Bad idea, right? Um, on the other hand, we are constantly trying to improve those services, not with an eye towards replacing those careful, delicate, person-to-person -person kind of conversations, but as a way to augment people who do have no insight into, say, Japanese at all. I'm a 0% Japanese speaker, and so that opens up an entire realm of information from Japan that I otherwise have zero access to. So. Uh, I will also point out that, uh, for example, in our translations of Turkish, um, we are doing a lot of very clever finessing of gender there so that, for example, uh, a lot of the discussion in the U.S. about uh, gender-appropriate pronouns, we are doing something similar to that in Turkish, right? So I think our technology will continue to improve, but I do think it's incumbent upon all of us to use the right technology, the right tool, the right method, the right time with the right set of people. So it doesn't give you the universal hammer. It simply gives you a, a great tool to use in certain times. A small screwdriver. A very small screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Um, is that, this is a question that's kind of like uh, directed at the moderator, and maybe you can translate it into a way for the, <laughs> for the, for the speakers. Um, but so I, I work here at the library. I, I work in the magazine newspaper center. Um, and you know we've tried to do workshops around um, improve your like news IQ when kind of looking at like how news gets you know through a, a billion kind of tech companies and comes to you. Um, they're not super popular, you know. It's like we, it's we know that there's topic. like we know <laughs> that there's like a social need for these things, obviously. And we you know the there was you know the PLP like you know did this whole thing on like developing um, a workshop around that that we that we you know tailored to our t people here. Um, you know, we, we do have this successful thing here in NSF called Tech Week, uh, where, you know, we bring a bunch of people in and a lot of different service providers and kind of talking about um, technology needs in San Francisco. It's like, you know, like to just get like public housing now, it's like you have to know how to use the internet, which a lot of people don't. Or to be able to apply to a job, you know, we, every day we have people that don't know how to do that stuff. They like, we don't, and we're not expecting people to become like tech wizards, but they do know how to use, they do need how to know how to need some like very simple tools for us. Um, 
to be able to be more competent in these things. But I guess it's like, for back, lack of a better word, like what's the marketing and like how do we make this stuff more interesting for people to get this, the tools that they that they need? Well, I think it's interesting because I think the in a lot of ways we feel like this burden has been placed on us that we have to be the people who teach how to use um, all of this. And I actually, this is in one of my questions to you guys earlier and it feeds nicely into this, which is like, what responsibilities do tech companies have to make sure that people, you know, understand the information that they're seeing online and how to evaluate it. And, you know, I, I know there, there's lots of different tools they're trying to do out there that are failing all over the place um, so that it doesn't just come to the libraries where people who are unfamiliar with this, like tech is scary. People aren't just going to come into the library, especially if they're already unfamiliar with a library, and the library is scary, and say, hey, uh, and especially if you're a person of color and a minority, hey, white lady, can you? I don't know how to do this, um, can, and I don't speak the same language as you. Can you please tell me how to do this? Like, that's, you know, that burden's on us, but I think there is some responsibility from, from tech to kind of solve a problem that has been created by, by them. Yeah, so I can start with that. So um, just like, uh, you know, big tech companies who profit off of uh, the monetization they have of journalistic and news and at times fake uh, and inflammatory content, um, just like they have a responsibility to partner with uh, like community, civil, civil society, journalistic, stakeholder organizations, so too, in my mind, do libraries have a responsibility to partner with community-based organizations in the constituencies that they serve. And I teach a class exactly on that topic for like 15 years at UCLA <laughs> um, on, on kind of community-based outreach because that actually, it, that's sort of responding partly to what you were just saying, Aaron. Um, so, you know, all of us are in our different roles are intermediaries, right? Like we all are in the middle between something and something else. And so we have to think about the values we're guided by when we choose to perform that service of being in the middle, in the center. Um, so yeah, to, to where the tech companies can go, I think it's, it's absolutely critical, and I know that there are some initiatives underway in this to really kind of partner with journalistic organizations. I know like the Knight Foundation, for example, has partnerships with um, a number of tech companies and so on. That's really important. But at the same time, I think that the issue here, which you alluded to, Greg, is about, you know, the, it's it's boring for people or whatever. I, I think what kind of content gets to people can, um, that keeps their interest and, it, and attention can still be journalistic while, like, maybe appealing to them and who they are. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we are the most, uh, you know, classical journalistic outlet, but I'm a guest host uh, quite often with the Young Turks, and I think we're like kind of keeping it real in our own ways. I mean, I'm not as loud as some of my co-hosts, um, but you know, I, I think we are certainly entertaining, or like, I mean, I can't believe random junk I, I, I say on there, there's like hundreds of thousands of people that watch it. And you know, so what, what I'm getting at here is there are other ways of presenting journalistic content that can still be fact-based, evidence-based, and ask the right questions. And I think it's, res it's a responsibility for us to think about what will appeal to our constituencies and present that content in that way or bring people together in that way as well. Right. So. I think we're just about at one minute. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll take 45 seconds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and point out that um, a big chunk of what I do is outreach and education, right? So I mentioned the Power Searching with Google class that we recently redid. It's had 4.4 million students go through it. That's pretty good. It's not bad for um, back of the envelope calculation. Um, but we do a lot of other outreach in addition to that. So we have, for example, support for, for historically black colleges and universities. We do outreach, uh, how, to, how to understand the news and so on in different places throughout the United States. We also have a lot of uh, support for journalists internationally. So we do a, a big, it's like a Knight Foundation-like operation yeah. uh, to support journalists in Europe and in other places throughout the world. We also do a lot of uh, pro bono teaching of journalists, so the people creating the news in the first place, how to use all the technology tools, not just Google. So we do a lot of sort of ground level teaching of students teaching of teachers, like with the, the faculty awards and so on. We also do the journalistic, teaching journalists how to do it. And then we've got these direct action, things like my move. 
So I, th I think we're actually doing a good job. We should, in my opinion, do more. Uh, but I think more to the, to the point of your question, I think all the technology companies have a responsibility to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think we're doing all right, but I want, I want more help from my partners in technology. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. thank you so much, and thank you, everybody, for your questions. And thank you for our panel again. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.